John Duncan Hart. And on behalf of those of us at the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series, I'd like to welcome you to this program today on anti-Semitism on college campuses. Uh, we will be with historian Dr. Ethan Katz, who is the director of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of California in Berkeley, where the faculty and administration have developed the Berkeley model for combating anti-Semitism on college campuses. Uh, this has become a model that has been uh, borrowed by other uh, universities, and um, I think we'll have a chance to hear more about that today. Um, he literally has been speaking coast to coast in the last uh, few weeks uh, on this topic, and uh, we were able to uh, catch him today in Berkeley at home. So we, we actually have a coast to coast uh, program today with Dr. Gottlieb in Rhode Island, and uh, so we welcome both of you here. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Katz, actually before this, was more known for his uh, groundbreaking, very interesting book on the burdens of brotherhood, uh, Jews and Muslims in North Africa, which won the National Jewish Book Award and a number of other awards. Um, and if you haven't seen that, it's it's an interesting study of, uh, of, of a particular case in Algeria. Uh, Dr. Katz will be interviewed today by anthropologist Dr. Alma Gottlieb of Brown University, who has spoken previously on the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series on her current work on the history and heritage of Cape Verdean Jewish, uh, the Jewish history there, and the people who are reclaiming that history today in a very interesting process. Uh, she is the, the past president of the Society of Humistic Anthropology, and her eight books and many articles on the being uh, people in West Africa has uh, set a standard for looking at women and children and religious thought, the understanding of life, um, and we appreciate that she can be here today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of those of you who donate to make these programs possible. And we especially would like to thank Dr. Doris Francis, uh, who is also an anthropologist, uh, for underwriting generously today's program in honor of the memory of Louise Earhart. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, Gloria Avalavalen and Bonnie Ellinger for their continuing work on the speakers program and identifying uh, programs for this uh, overall series. So it's my pleasure to welcome professors Ethan Katz and Alma Gottlieb to the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series on this subject that is of such concern to all of us. And uh, Dr. Gottlieb, if you would like to start. Thanks so much for inviting us both. It's an honor for me to play this role in engaging uh, my colleague, Dr. Katz, in this conversation. He is uh, an esteemed, really leading scholar um, of Jewish studies in general, and at this moment uh, has become a really respected national spokesperson um, on this disturbing topic of rising anti-Semitism on U.S. campuses, having played a role of a really courageous leader on his own campus at UC Berkeley, as you mentioned, uh, in creating this initiative on anti-Semitism uh, education, which is becoming uh, a model really nationally for many campuses. So I think some of the conversation that we're going to uh, have today maybe start out uh, on a disturbing note, thinking about the problems, and then um, I hope we'll allow enough time toward uh, the latter half of the conversation to talk about, if not solutions, at least strategies. Um, but why don't we start off uh, by having you talk about what you see as the current greatest challenges facing campuses today uh, concerning uh, what we all know is a rise in anti-Semitism. Um, yeah, just start with that, maybe. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Alma, for, for joining me. Um, it's a pleasure to 
share the virtual dais with you. Um, and thank you uh, for, for inviting me, Ron, uh, back uh, on, onto the Santa Fe uh, Distinguished Lecture Series program. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, our, our challenges on campus at the moment are, are many. Um, and, you know, I think <laughs> um, what I see, first of all, I think it's important to recognize we've got sort of two major uh, narratives about anti-Semitism uh, that represent major strands of anti-Semitism uh, current today in our country. Um, and one of our challenges is that uh, the most significant challenge nationally for anti-Semitism, I think all of the statistics continue to bear out the fact that it is actually white nationalism. It is by far, uh, in terms of percentage of, of people within a movement who have deeply anti-Semitic views, uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, and it has also been the source of most anti-Semitic violence in this country. Uh, and it's important to note that while we're going to talk most of the time about a different strand of uh, anti-Semitism and, and where it overlaps with views on Israel, uh, white nationalism also on certain college campuses is a serious, serious concern. Uh, it depends what region of the country you're in. Where I teach at Berkeley, if you're a white nationalist on campus, you're, I don't know if there are any, if they are, they're, they're, they're uh, in hiding. But, um, but the fact is that, that that's not true everywhere. Uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that overall uh, enormous danger, which obviously is also a danger to our democracy uh, and a danger that I think we're going to need to pay more and more attention to in the course of this calendar year, given the coming election and uh, the players in that election. Having said all that, uh, the other um, major strand of anti-Semitism is somewhere uh, in what people sometimes refer to as the far left or the woke left, uh, where certain ideas about Jews, not always necessarily about Israel, sometimes they're connected to globalization, sometimes they're connected to um, power and oppression, but frequently uh, where ideas about Israel that are very critical move into a different category uh, that is actually hostile uh, toward Jews, uh, that is, um, you know, uh, discriminatory toward Jews, that is hateful toward Jews, that is exclusion, exclusionary toward Jews. Um, and that problem uh, is very present on a number of college campuses. Uh, but I think that in some ways, one of the really big challenges we face is not even close to all of the criticism of Israel that's going on on college campuses is anti-Semitic. Um, I don't even think a majority of it is anti-Semitic. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out how to address a real problem uh, without silencing uh, all pro-Palestinian speech. Uh, and so we're, in some ways, we're, we're in a real kind of binary moment where so many people have taken a position that says that uh, strongly pro-Palestinian speech is inherently anti-Semitic post-October 7th. I know we're going to talk about post-October 7th as a defining moment. Uh, and other people uh, have said that, uh, you know, strongly Zionist speech post-October 7th is inherently anti-Palestinian. Uh, and so what you have is you have two major groups on many campuses like my own who have legitimate grievances and legitimate concerns about uh, both the way they are being spoken about uh, and challenges to their capacity to speak on behalf of uh, causes and entities to which they feel deep, uh, often personal and familial attachments. Wow, you've raised so many um, critical points. Um, I'm hoping we can tease out some of the implications of all of them. Um, you are trained as a historian and you've kind of gestured toward a trajectory. Maybe we could start there. Uh, anti-Semitism has over, sadly, a 2,000-year history. It's taken different forms in different places, of which you're uh, far more aware than, than I. Um, given your historical training, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how uh, you and your colleagues trained in history um, can bring special insights. If we take a more um, long-term view uh, from the long durée perspective, yep. um, what can we learn from looking at the different kinds of anti-Semitism in different eras and places, and how can that help us understand the present moment? 
Yeah, so I think that's a that's a great question. That's a crucial question. Um, I mean, one thing that's really hard about the present moment is that historically, anti-Semitism is more than a hatred. It's more than exclusion of Jews. Uh, it is typically a whole worldview and political program. Um, and it's not clear that all current manifestations of anti-Semitism fit that mold, right? Um, so, you know, uh, anti-Judaism, as it's still often defined by scholars, uh, goes back about 2,000 years. Uh, it actually predates uh, early Christianity. Um, it can be found in ancient Egypt. It can be found in ancient Greece. But it emerges more strongly as we sort of come to know it uh, around uh, Christian hostility to Jews for not uh, accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah uh, and, and the false but remarkably persistent accusation that Jews murdered Christ, uh, which then plays out in a whole series of ways in the Middle Ages, uh, particularly around uh, blood libel accusations against Jews, around ideas that Jews poison wells, um, that Jews financially exploit. Uh, and many of those ideas then morph in the 19th century, right, uh, with the emergence of what we often call racial anti-Semitism, which is the idea that Jews not only, or not simply, I should say, are um, practicing a religion that is uh, outmoded and hostile to Christianity, from which, at least theoretically, they could convert, uh, but that they are biologically different, a part of a whole trend in race thinking, right, that also targets um, Blacks and uh, all kinds of you know, Muslims, all kinds of groups from the global south, right? So, so that that's obviously a very um, quick schema that I just gave. Uh, but in the case of both um, Christian hostility toward Jews, and in the case of nineteenth century and then you know twentieth uh, century, culminating with uh, the Shoah, the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews, with that type of racial anti-Semitism. In both those cases, we're talking about a whole worldview where Jews help people to make sense of complex problems in the world by blaming them on Jews, right? Um, and so it's important to understand that anti-Semitism is often this kind of worldview. Uh, at base, in certain ways, it is above all a conspiracy theory uh, that Jews are the source of the world's problems. Um, but the question is partly how, with that history in mind, we make sense about certain moments where rhetoric around Israel seems to spill over into anti-Semitism, uh, but it's not necessarily clear that it's part of this kind of longer history of anti-Semitism where it's an entire uh, political program, while also fearing sometimes that Israel becomes a stand-in for Jews and that blaming Israel for everything becomes a new worldview uh, for, for certain kinds of anti-Semites uh, today. Um, you know, one way that historians contribute to this discussion is by looking at what we call anti-Semitic tropes, right? Long-standing stereotypes about Jews, uh, that Jews are financially powerful and exploiting those who are less wealthy, uh, that Jews are uh, puppeteers manipulating those uh, in power, uh, that Jews are connected to um, things like uh, filth and, um, you know, uh, sort of D disgusting uh, uh, elements, uh, that Jews are particularly uh, bloodthirsty, right? These are all traditional stereotypes. And it's often very helpful when we're talking about stereotypes or attacks uh, around Israel that we can say, when these show up, they've spilled over into anti-Semitism, right? So that, that's an important uh, contribution uh, that historians can also make. Um, and by the same token, uh, we have to recognize that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has its own history. Um, it's interlaced with the history of anti-Semitism in important ways, but critiques of Israel, including fierce critiques of Israel, have a very long history. Uh, and actually one of their longest histories is within the Jewish community, including in the American Jewish community. Um, and so sorting out these pieces from each other, uh, it, it's not simple. Right. Um, and it requires a level of care and thoughtfulness that is, in many respects, antithetical to the tenor of current conversations on and off of campuses. Yes, indeed. Uh, that's an amazing answer. And it um, I think you've illustrated so um, pungently uh, why we need history more than ever to understand the present moment. Um, 
you've in both of your um, responses, you've touched on the nature of anti-Semitism, what we mean by anti-Semitism, how it can be misconstrued, misinterpreted, uh, bleed over into other uh, related but distinct uh, concerns. Maybe without spending too much time in semantics, you could just very briefly uh, summarize your thinking about how how we can best think about how to define anti-Semitism, and does it matter uh, that we defined it in a particular way? Right. Um, I mean, I think that anti-Semitism at base is discrimination, hatred, or exclusion against Jewish individuals, groups, entities, or institutions because they are Jewish, right? Um, and it can include attitudes, actions, systemic conditions, um, uh, that, that keep Jews from being able to fully participate as equals in political life, religious life, cultural life, economic life, social life. Uh, and it has a lot in common in those ways with other forms of exclusion like anti-Black racism, anti-LGBTQ plus discrimination. Uh, what's one of the things that is different about anti-Semitism, uh, first of all, I think... Um, Unlike uh, some other forms of discrimination, uh, it often becomes this entire worldview. Um, <clears throat> but secondly, it focuses a lot on Jews not as inferior necessarily, although they are depicted as racially inferior in certain um, anti-Semitic tropes, tropes and discourses, but on Jews as very powerful, right? Um, my friend Deborah Lipset likes to say, the racist punches down, the anti-Semite punches up, right? Um, and so that's an important uh, distinction. Yeah, that's that's really useful. Thank you. Um, well, you've alluded to um, forms of anti-Semitism, both coming from the right, which uh, you point out is the predominant form now in the U.S., and from the left, uh, which is a more recent and smaller, but perhaps more vocal group at mm. the moment, post October 7th, at least. I'm wondering, especially because um, that critique is now so salient on so many campuses, including your own, um, if you could maybe talk about the ironies of both the extreme left and the extreme right converging uh, in this disturbing mm. uh, trend. What do they have in common? Um, how are they different? How should we wrap our heads around the fact that the seemingly same critique is coming from both ends um, of the political spectrum that normally see each other as opposed? Yeah, I, I mean, some of the critiques are remarkably similar in terms of certain tropes, particularly about Jewish power and uh, Jewish finance. Um, and in some ways, they're quite different, right? Um, the far right is more likely to embrace a kind of classical anti-Semitism, very vocally racial anti-Semitism. Uh, their views on Israel are often complicated. Uh, some of them would be perfectly happy for all Jews to go to Israel. And they even have a certain kind of affinity sometimes with Israel as what they regard think quite overly simplistically as an ethno state, right? In, in for them, a positive way. Of course, we know that uh, Israel as an ethno state is also uh, a claim made by certain people on the far left, um, which I think is is overly uh, simplistic to be sure, uh, and, and which many people who defend Israel staunchly resist. Um, but for the far right, uh, that can actually be something that they see as appealing. Uh, if you're a, a white nationalist in America, and it means that all the Jews are going to leave uh, because they shouldn't be here anyway, and, and you regard them as, as danger, uh, then you could be quite sympathetic to certain aspects of Zionism. The far left, um, you know, first of all, in many ways, of course, the a lot of the ideals being expounded today by the activist left uh, are seen as directly antithetical, of course, to white nationalism. And in a conventional sense, they would be potentially allied with the fight against far-right anti-Semitism, right? Ideals of anti-racism, ideals uh, of a more equitable society, uh, ideas of stamping out all forms of discrimination, right? Um, unfortunately, uh, in many cases, Jews don't get included in the groups that are seen as facing discrimination, uh, facing any kind of exclusion, uh, needing to be lifted up, but rather, in some cases, have been, in my view, 
caricatured as simply white, uh, because most American Jews are white-skinned, uh, simply privileged, simply powerful, uh, and therefore actually end up being uh, classified. I mean, we had one survey uh, from uh, Harvard Caps poll uh, a couple of months ago that asked people, uh, do you agree with the statement that Jews are an oppressor class? Uh, and some 60% of people said yes. Um, now, that's a that survey could be dug into, and there's a lot of things that seem to be... Um, there seems to be a lot of cognitive dissonance in the overall results of that survey, so I don't want it to come away from it with too uh, grand a, of an overarching conclusion. But that is a striking finding, right? I mean, the idea that in any credible survey, a very large number of people would identify Jews as an oppressor class, it flies completely in the face of Jewish history. It flies in the face of uh, contemporary uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, and it tells you something, I think, about the challenge for the activist left in trying to figure out sort of what to do with Jews and often resorting to caricatures of Jews as privileged, powerful, and white, and then aligning their view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with that, right? Israel becomes, in that view, a white state, despite the fact that more than half of Israelis are not of European descent. They're of Arab, um, or, you know, or uh, from Israeli, uh, you know, Jews from Arab lands. Uh, that's where they come from. Um, you know, despite all the complexity of uh, Jews' history as being racialized in Europe, um, Israel becomes white. Israel becomes an oppressor state against um, colored people in this narrative. Uh, and so people often want to kind of uh, transport the idea of Jim Crow in America to the Middle East. Uh, there's a lot to be critical of in an empirical way in the, kind of, in the conduct of Israel's government, in the history of Zionism, in terms of the way it has displaced Palestinians. And, and uh, I don't want to be at all, um, I don't want to mince words about that. I don't want to minimize uh, the incredible import of that history and of the unfolding humanitarian catastrophe that is going on right now in Gaza. Uh, so I don't want to be misunderstood in anything I say to be minimizing that. But the fact of the matter is understanding that conflict through the lens of white supremacy and racial oppression of people of color uh, is incredibly distorting uh, in terms of trying to actually understand what's going on. Yeah, again, these are so many uh, subtle, complicated, interrelated points you've made. Um, your points touch on my own research, looking at the history of Cape Verdeans who have Jewish ancestry. And I think for many, many Americans, um, the common association of Jews with white people is so problematic, uh, well, it's so widely understood and accepted um, and not problematized. Um, and I think so many Americans would be shocked to know that only recently were Jews in the US classificatory scheme classified as white people. Um, but um, even subtracting Ashkenazim who, who were classified as people of color until fairly recently, there are so many other uh, Jews um, with Sephardic or Mizrahi uh, origins, uh, whom very few people would classify as white even today. So I think that U.S. binary um, is so problematic when it comes to Jews. It's problematic for many other reasons, too. But all of that leads me to think, and you've started gesturing towards this, um, we've identified a lot of issues, a lot of challenges, a lot of problems. Um, as an educator yourself, who has really thought deeply and thoughtfully um, about how to mobilize your own um, stance and position and podium um, to educating students. That's our goal. Um, there are many layers of thinking about how to approach the campus as a space of education, uh, but you and I and Ron have um, spent our lives as educators. Maybe we could start with that. What advice do you have for professors, any professors who might be on the call or later, um, for how to start educating students? Um, anybody with a PhD in uh, Middle East studies or history like you already knows what they're doing. What about everybody else? What can our colleagues in um, chemistry or English or other fields um, where they're not already specialists in Mideast history, what can they be doing to um, incite conversation that is uh, meaningful, grounded, productive, and um, promotes listening? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'd say two broad things. One is, you know, we came through a period uh, in the last few years where I think a lot of uh, colleagues sought to figure out how to respond 
to the George Floyd moment, uh, Black Lives Matter, a movement for racial justice in this country by creating greater sensitivity around race in their courses wherever they possibly could. Um, and there are some people who will debate, you know, uh, what's been uh, most or less effective uh, in that. But I, I think on the whole, it's created far greater sensitivity about the African-American experience and the need for racial justice and, um, you know, ways we still have to go to achieve that more fully. That should be applied for a series of groups. I think also it, it there are colleagues who've, who've sought to do that work as, as well for LGBTQ plus uh, individuals on issues of sexism in the, in the uh, light of the Me Too movement. Um, this is a moment that calls for a greater thoughtfulness about the Jewish experience and where Jews fit into the fabric potentially of your course. Uh, and that can take the form of highlighting important contributions by Jews to all kinds of areas that I think are actually largely not being taught unless you take certain courses on American university campuses today. Uh, the importance of Jews in certain realms of science, the importance of Jews in creating um, Hollywood, the importance of Jews in creating Broadway and uh, jazz in this country, um, you know, uh, Jewish contributions in a whole realm of areas, but also Jewish experiences with persecution, the long history of Jewish persecution, the inter relationship between anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred in many times and places, including our own. So that's one thing where I think, you know, in the same way that we've sought to expand our palette to think more about the range of experiences, the range of contributions, and the range of experiences of suffering and persecution of various groups, Jews can productively be brought into that effort uh, with, without a huge amount of effort. And, and you know, most campuses, there are people like myself who would be happy to sit with colleagues and say, okay, this is what your course is about. What do you do here? What do you do there? Here are some thoughts. The second piece is if you're going to talk about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, um, spend some time educating yourself, first of all, um, just like on any uh, complicated topic. This is a very complex topic. Um, and the people on each side who try to reduce it to something that's not complex um, are, are doing us a tremendous disservice. Start from the reality that there are two peoples here with a tremendous history of persecution that they have faced, uh, a tremendous need for homeland and safety and security, and a tremendously deep history in this space that they've been sharing and contesting now uh, for over a century, Jews and Palestinians. Um, and in this moment, start from the reality that both Jews and Palestinians are experiencing this current war as a war of existential import. Gazans feel that they see the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, being reenacted in their own lifetime uh, or being continued. And Israelis, terrified by what happened on October 7th, feel that they have been so opened up and made so vulnerable and that they have no choice but to respond very forcefully to restore their security. You can disagree with those perspectives. You can critique them. You can pull out where is trauma and where is uh, you know, historical facticity. But those are realities uh, that millions of people are experiencing. Uh, and, and, and acknowledge that for your students uh, rather than picking up a slogan that you think is showing solidarity with the group that you most identify with uh, and simultaneously, therefore, alienating people who are also experiencing real trauma on the other side. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, uh, we definitely seem to have a shortage of empathy all around in the country um, at the moment on so many levels, and this is one of them. Um, empathy often seems to be uh, the number one uh, desiderata uh, that's lacking. Um, the um, the history of relations between Jews and people of color in general and Black uh, Americans in particular is a really interesting one. Mm. Um, there have been key moments in American history where um, Jewish and Black uh, leaders and groups and on the ground, rank and file people have been strategically allied uh, for common goals. Uh, this isn't one of those moments. And so uh, I wonder again, as a historian, 
um, how you might see possibilities for entree uh, into a possible new alliances that have been fractured uh, in recent years? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. It's a hard question. We, mm -hmm. we didn't get here overnight, right? Um, you know, the the fact is, I think over, over a long period of time, I mean, we should back up and say that the question of Jews and whiteness in the United States is a complex one, in part because Jews themselves, in many cases, really sought to be accepted as white in many places, in certain leading Jewish organizations. Um, and, you know, there was a, I think there was a period of time across the mid to late 20th century where Jews could be substantially in large numbers accepted as basically white and continue to inflect their politics with a sense of a minority experience and a history of persecution that was long and deep, that included elements in this country, things like uh, you know, neighborhoods where both Jews and Blacks were redlined, and that you know for, for many people was most palpable in their connections that they had to the Holocaust. Uh, and so in a way, Jews could a little bit have their cake and eat it too in terms of both being accepted and being able to remain at the forefront of uh, minority politics. Um, I think that that, and, and and maybe the last high watermark of that was the presidency of Barack Obama, who was surrounded throughout his career and in his presidency by Jews. Uh, many uh, of his closest advisors, about half of his European ambassadors were Jewish. I, I could go on. Um, but I think that what's happened is Israel's become a much more polarized issue in American politics. Uh, and certain key figures have been successful in uh, trying to capture uh, American Jewish support uh, on that uh, and certain other uh, wedge issues, um, the the, um, the social demographics uh, of the Jewish community have, have also uh, changed um, in terms of class politics uh, in ways that, that have pushed some people more toward conservatism as well. Uh, but so that's all created structural conditions that are very different from where they were when Jews and Blacks were uh, aligned in many causes. Uh, and then we, of course, have the fact that the Palestinian cause has become maybe the, at, this, at least at this moment, certainly in the post-October 7th moment, but it was already emerging, maybe the sort of, you know, cause celebre of civil rights in the eyes of many, many progressives and many, many people of color who feel they identify so strongly with the Palestinian experience. Um, so, I mean, I, there's a history of Jews articulating the meaning of Zionism in ways that has connected for many African Americans to the African American experience. Um, and the question is how Jews can find a way to do that again. I think the reality is what we probably need is an alliance of liberal progressive Jews who can both hold up uh, a, a, um, an inclusive uh, vision of Zionism and, and Israel's future alongside a group of Palestinians who are advocating for a Palestinian state, but very clearly not for the elimination of any Jewish entity, and then African Americans who see these causes as aligned with their values. I think that's where there's a possibility. Uh, I think in the binary discourse of today, particularly as long as this war persists. I mean, when when calling for ceasefire uh, is, there's a whole range of what that means. But for some people, calling for a ceasefire is equated with opposing Israel's right to defend itself, or worse. Uh, it's very hard to get anywhere in terms of thinking about what alliances are possible. Um, so my hope is that when we move from the war to possible visions of reconstruction, that there will, that there will be a robust debate within the Zionist camp and that there will be uh, some strands that emerge that want to work with some strands in the Palestinian camp and that, that there perhaps there could be you know, a new alliance. Yeah, well, you've given us a, a opening a crack for a glimmer of hope, which I think we're all desperate for. Um, maybe uh, moving in those directions, I'm thinking about um, the DEI initiatives, diversity, um, equity, and inclusion that have become 
uh, both salient across many, many, uh, perhaps most college campuses at this point, and have also become a flashpoint for a backlash uh, by the right. Um, and they're occupying a really complicated space from what I see on college campuses. Uh, there is some call among progressive uh, Jews to include Jews uh, within these initiatives. And then there's pushback against uh, that effort. And then there's general pushback against the whole effort and Supreme Court is weighing in and so forth. So DEI seems to be in some ways maybe structurally occupying a really key position, possibly for good, possibly for not good um, on campuses. Where does anti-Semitism in your view fit in? And is does does that sound seem like a a productive space for uh, Jews to start engaging and um, potentially forming these kinds of alliances? Yes. So we've done a lot of work um, trying to engage in the DEI space at UC Berkeley, and, and I think with some important success. Uh, mm -hmm. When we started our project, Jews and anti-Semitism were really not part of the purview of the DEI office at Berkeley. That remains the case in many, many places. Um, with the current leadership in DEI that's now been there for a few years. They've been very explicit that they see Jews as central to their mission. They see anti-Semitism as central to their mission. Um, and so that's been a very welcome change. Uh, and it has allowed for us to work with them in a sustained way. Um, but it is, it, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, so conceptually, it's a challenge all over because DEI is focused, I mean, the E in DEI is for equity, it's not for equality. It's about structural impediments to equal opportunity. Uh, it's about structural forms of oppression. Jews, by and large, in this country do not suffer from structural inequalities, right? They suffer from hatred at times. They suffer from certain kinds of uh, political or social exclusions in, in particular contexts. Um, historically, Jews have suffered structural oppression in many kinds of places, including in the United States, uh, for, for decades or longer. Um, but that's not the form of hatred or discrimination that Jews face today. And that's different from almost any other group that DEI offices serve. Um, you know, once uh, a colleague and I gave a presentation, do a lot of these trainings through our initiative uh, for a group of DEI folks. And one of them said, what I learn in listening to you is that our work which is focused always on opening ladders of opportunity, that that's not enough because Jews have often faced the greatest persecution when they have been able to find opportunity and success economically and socially, which I thought was a beautiful insight, right? Um, so, um, but I think that conceptually it's a challenge, right? So maybe there's an opening uh, with, with an insight like that to say sort of like, you know, um, equity plus, you know, how, how do we combat uh, hatred in, in other uh, forms that will be persistent no matter what opportunities uh, you can secure for yourself. Um, but the other huge challenge is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? I mean, that's a huge space where uh, forms of exclusion toward Jews, whether we even have to always call them anti-Semitism or not, are coming up. And people in DEI offices, by and large, understandably, Right, they are facing two different campus populations that have legitimate concerns and grievances around the conflict and very different perspectives on a lot of rhetoric and a lot of action around that conflict. And so they are often very wary of taking the kind of active role that sometimes we believe they should take uh, in order to support Jewish students or combat certain types of uh, hate speech uh, in that space because uh, the issues are complex. and. And they're not trained in those issues. And they come with the same question that many of our listeners probably have, which is, OK, where do I get training on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that will actually be even-handed or, I want to say objective, nothing's objective, but, um, you know, that, that, that will give me a, enough of a kind of, you know, rounded perspective, right? Uh, and they can't get one answer to that question either from uh, people in opposing camps. Uh, so 
you know, I, I think we, we need a lot more opportunities for education on these issues. We need to continue to engage with DEI offices. We, we have disagreements with our DEI office at times at Berkeley, but the door's always open and um, we look for where we can collaborate. Um, and, you know, I don't think the DEI structure is going anywhere um, in terms of the fact that I think it's here to stay for quite a while. Uh, because it's become deeply embedded. Uh, and there certainly are a number of important areas that I think the I offices are working on. Um, and so I think the other, I mean, the other piece is if we want to build alliances, we have to figure out how to show up as Jews to support others who are facing oppression and exclusion. Uh, we want them to show up for us. Uh, we have to figure out how to show up for them. Um, and that's something that you know, uh, in a time where we feel we're kind of under siege and that many people who would be our natural allies are not our natural allies, it's really hard to figure out how to show up for other people uh, if you feel like they don't understand where you are. Right. Uh, I have so many more questions, but I'm seeing a ton in the <laughs> Q&A window. Ron, would it make sense for us to open it up now instead of me monopolizing our, our guest? Um, yes, you're right. We do have a ton of questions here. And um, so um, let's let's start with this. Um, so there's uh, uh, from an anonymous attendee, isn't anti-Judaism a lot older than you indicated? The Romans didn't exactly like the Jews either. Question. Um, right. So I think I said it goes back at least 2000 years. I did indicate that it existed in ancient Greece, it existed in ancient Egypt, and yes, it also existed in ancient Rome. Um, uh, don't misunderstand me. Uh, yes, so we, we know a lot less about ancient anti-Judaism because it, it's a, the records are more scant, uh, but certainly uh, Jews faced important discrimination uh, and obstacles to their basic practices and continuity uh, under a number of ancient empires. So I didn't mean to minimize that. Uh, the forms in which it's come down to us in the West are in many ways shaped by early Christianity's hostility toward Jews. Um, so th that's why I focus more there. David Schulman also mentions um, the Inquisition as racial anti-Semitism. Uh, yes, uh, a statement with which I don't really disagree. Um, I was again, in the short format that we have here, trying to give us a schema that I think is important, which is that uh, there's there's a fundamental difference between a context in which Jews uh, could at least theoretically convert, which was true in the Inquisition, despite the fact that I think Jews do become racialized. There's a lot of good research on that. Both Jews and Muslims become racialized in a, a Catholic uh, schema in the Inquisition. Um, but, if, but at least in theory, it's about religion. It's about the fact that if people need to convert and become Catholic, right? Uh, no way to convert to become an Aryan uh, in the context of Nazi racial anti-Semitism, right? So I, I wanted to draw that distinction, but they're they're fuzzy, right? The fact is there's all kinds of religious tropes that end up being important for racial anti-Semitism, and there's no question that already uh, in the context of Christian anti-Judaism, Jews are becoming racialized. So the point is well taken. The um, uh, Raymond Ter, uh, Termini makes uh, has a question comment about uh, DEI, which I think you've already addressed in your last uh, your last question. So, um, to um, but I, 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 I will just respond quickly because it says, "Are there viable alternatives?" Right? Um, right. DEI is maybe the wrong vehicle. Um, the fact is, we have also worked closely with Student Affairs on our campus. Uh, that's that's an office that we worked with for years before uh, we established a closer relationship with DEI and we continue to work with them. Uh, and sometimes because their um, remit is just more broadly serving and supporting students, um, they are less uh, sort of embroiled in some of the uh, ideological struggles around DEI uh, and, and sometimes able in that way to work a little bit more freely uh, on the, various causes on campus, including anti-Semitism. Uh, and there have been a number of campuses, I think, where people have found it a, a more natural to work with uh, student affairs. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Ellen Bromley is is asking our students arriving to campus with these anti-Semitic attitudes formed already, or are they developing them on the campus? And of course, this has been one of the concerns about what's the role of faculty in all this. You know? Um. I mean, of course, people come to campuses with opinions already, right? I mean, this is a this is a reason that the work we do on campus, while very important, uh, is insufficient. Um, we really need to be extending that work uh, into high schools um, because what people know or don't know uh, or think or don't think when they arrive on campus uh, is fundamentally important. Uh, obviously on, on all issues, including this one. Um, so I think there is a great a growing hunger to do more of this education at the high school level. Uh, and, you know, the, the challenge is really that we need more programs, we need more resources. Sometimes people ask us about doing that work. Uh, we don't have the bandwidth right now, uh, really, to support high schools in a, in a substantial, sustaining way, right? We, we occasionally do programs in high schools when we're asked to do programs in high schools, but uh, it, it's something that requires its, its own major initiative. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think on, on campuses, I mean, Alma, you asked me about advice for professors earlier in terms of how to incorporate better uh, Jewish experiences and Jewish concerns into a range of classes. And I, I think that that would be valuable. Uh, there are definitely uh, courses occasionally that are truly anti-Semitic. Uh, I, I think that's quite rare. Um, I think what happens more frequently is that there are offhand remarks or there are particular sessions of a class uh, that do not account in a very thoughtful or robust way for Jewish perspectives and that can say things that are um, strikingly ignorant from a professor who doesn't know very much about Jews or the Jewish experience and sort of throws something out there uh, thoughtlessly. Uh, that can be very alienating for Jewish students and very hard to combat because uh, most students struggle to argue uh, with their professors. Uh, and, you know, we try to provide resources for students to come and, uh, you know, express concerns, lodge complaints. Uh, but, you know, the, the broader answer to that is figuring out how to educate more widely and including educating faculty. Uh, and as a faculty member, I'll say, and all my imagine you'll agree, uh, the, the problem is, you know, faculty generally um, don't think that they have a lot to learn. Uh, <laughs> and so figuring out how to educate our colleagues on this topic is, is not easy. You know, if I could just insert a question here. Uh, it, it seems to me that this, uh, the criticism of faculty is something we hear more from the right, from uh, commentators who are, are questioning. Um, and I, I, I'd like to ask you your, your, your thoughts on this. Um, is this something that is running parallel to like the, the questioning of media, the questioning of other institutions in our society? Um, what is the role of this this? questioning of faculty, that the faculty are responsible for what's happening? Um, I mean, the problem, look, so I, I think there is a broader attack on universities from conservatives that is largely dangerous and misguided, uh, which is to say that, um, you know, universities are liberal institutions that are indoctrinating people uh, with left-wing ideas that are destructive to American society. I'm being a little bit crude and reductionist, but this is sort of a narrative that is uh, increasingly widespread. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, uh, universities are not, by and large, uh, in my view, taken over by these ideas, and most faculty are not taken over by uh, these ideas. And there's a lot of really important learning going on on uh, practically all university campuses uh, rather than indoctrination. And I think the attacks are sometimes a, a very systematic uh, attack on institutions of higher education and one that uh, really threatens to, to undermine uh, the importance of those institutions and our capacity uh, to do 
the kind of work in some ways that we were talking about earlier in the program, which is to teach people about complexity, right? I mean, universities are rare spaces where people can engage deeply with ideas, engage deeply with people who are not from the same background and don't share the same views as them. Uh, if we destroy the capacity of universities to be a credible place that incubates the exchange of ideas, um, that I think is the implications are terrifying for our country. Um, so we should ask questions about everybody who has the capacity to um, share ideas and be influential in, in the sharing and, and propagation of ideas. Uh, and faculty are not an exception to that. Uh, but I worry that some of the uh, questioning is, is not questioning. It's it's a wholesale uh, and kind of um, you know very you know blunt uh, and undiscriminating attack on faculty. Um, so yeah, figuring out you know I, I think I mean, just take a step back. There are some good programs, right? Uh, there's a program called the Academic Engagement Network, uh, which runs seminars for faculty and administrators and staff uh, on university campuses across the country. Uh, and there are uh, faculty who take part in those. Um, I think figuring out how to establish programs that will have the greatest level of credibility uh, and that probably need to be structured in the case of Israel-Palestine around kind of dual narrative um, and, and encouraging faculty to realize that in this day and age, they probably need to know something uh, and something more sophisticated than very surface level about that conflict, right? having some programs that teach about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, uh, right, in, in nuanced ways, right, uh, that are have a wide credibility, uh, that's probably what we need to be able to do and then uh, incentivize faculty to take part in seminars, um, you know, se summer seminars of even a few days around those issues um, that could be, I mean, that, that could have a really significant impact if we could do it well and do it on a wide scale. The question from Laurie Guerin about the UC Ethnic Studies Faculty Council um, and uh, some of the the um, issues that have developed around that. Um, can you address that? Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, the Ethnic Studies Faculty Council made a strong recommendation uh, that there be... Um, well, first of all, they made a strong recommendation for the requiring of teaching of ethnic studies curriculum uh, for all entering uh, students to be eligible to enter schools in the UC system. Um, and then, yes, they they made a statement post October 7th that I think was extraordinarily problematic. There was a very forceful response uh, from um, one of the regents about that. Um, in the end, right now, the recommendation of the faculty uh, council on uh, ethnic studies for those uh, requirements has been rejected, uh, at least for now, uh, by the regions. I think it was a seven to five vote. Um, so it uh, doesn't, uh, I'm certain that the issue is not going away and that uh, there will be efforts to bring it up again. Um, but that was, for many people, uh, a relief. Um, and the ethnic studies debates have been raging for the last several years in California. Um, and I think here again, it's a very, it's a very sharp binary uh, that's very unfortunate in terms of being able to get into, you know, uh, a situation. I mean, we'd all like to get to a situation where all of the reasons that ethnic studies have been pushed uh, by certain groups for years to help uh, for a broader understanding of the African American experience and the Latino American experience. Um, and the Native American experience, the Asian American experience, right? Those, those are all important. Um, and we ought to be able to do that without it being at the expense of Jews. We ought to be able to find a way to incorporate Palestinian perspectives as well. Um, the problem is figuring out how to do that uh, without the debate being immediately poisoned by accusations from both sides. Uh, and we, we clearly, have not figured out how to do that. Yeah, yeah. Rose Zaitchik um, has an interesting question, which is about the age differentiation between the anti-Semitism of the left and the anti-Semitism of the right. Um, and I think is getting more into the, the issue of, of 
generational uh, perspectives on this issue. Um, can you comment on that? Um, I mean, I think there, yeah, there's a, there's a very significant generational gap in the American Jewish community uh, around these issues. Um, you know, um, I was asked about this lecture I gave recently at Barnard. Um, I think a lot of younger American Jews who feel even, even if they feel strong attachments to Israel, but feel far more critical about Israel's policies and Israel's conduct, uh, feel that, that uh, voicing criticisms with their parents or the parents' generation, often with the leadership of institutions which, to which they may have some connection, is extremely difficult, right? Uh, and they feel that if you cannot acknowledge the suffering of Palestinians, they really are not interested in engaging in conversation with you. Uh, some of them feel you know, positions quite a bit to the left of that, but that's sort of the basic starting point. And I think for people of older generations, the assumption has always been that the existence of Israel, whatever Israel's foibles, is a good thing, is a just thing, is not only a good thing for Jews, but is a just thing in the annals of human rights in the 20th century. Um, and that basic assumption has been radically undercut uh, by a, a group of activists of younger generations, including some number uh, of far left American Jews. Uh, and I think that's extremely difficult uh, for people of uh, older generations to, to countenance. And so they're defensive and they would like to at least know that at the starting point, no one is attacking the very idea of Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, and so those you know those conversations right now are are very difficult to have, and people are are largely in their own camps uh, not speaking to each other. I think that's a huge generation gap in the American Jewish community. In terms of far left and far right anti-Semitism, I'm actually not sure there's a generation gap there. Uh, I think we should not underestimate the number of young people who have been indoctrinated as white nationalists in this country. Um, I think if you look at places like the rally in Charlottesville. That wasn't a bunch of 70 or 60-year-olds uh, out there. That was a bunch of young people out there. Uh, those were people who were roughly the same age as far-left activists. Uh, there are also older activists in both camps. Um, you know, I think uh, they, they come, by and large, from profoundly different backgrounds and experiences that make them more likely to, to um, gravitate to one camp or the other. But I don't think the difference there is actually generational. We have so many questions. The, the dialogue here has become a, um, a, a very interesting series of concerns and, and appreciations. Um, it, one of the ones, a question that's come up by two or three people, is um, about the anti-Semitic activities on, on campuses and the suggestion that they are receiving funds from uh, international sources. Uh, David Shulman mentions the Popular Front of the Liberation of Palestine, for example. Um, uh, can you comment on that? And if I could just interject a quick footnote from one of the campuses with which I have an affiliation myself, Brown University, has just been uh, the subject of an extensive uh, critical report um, by a Washington, D.C., a uh, group looking at uh, potential funding for Mideast studies on this campus. I imagine that similar investigations are going on and will go on for other campuses as well. It'd be interesting for you to share your thoughts on on that kind of funding for professorships. For professorships. But um, I thought your question, Ron, was about students for justice in Palestine, or did I mishear you? Right, right, yeah. But, uh, now, but I, wonder I was just tour, adding us. If the two are related. I, right. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Ron, I just want to make sure you, well, your question was about funding or was about SJP more broadly? It was about funding. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't feel like I, I'm super qualified to comment on how these um, organizations are funded. Um, okay. You know, I, I think. Um, it's a fair question. Uh, SJP's origins were quite organic and grassroots. Um, who their primary funding sources are today, it's hard to say. Um, SJP's 
uh, chapters have some amount of variation. Um, part of the reason they've been in the crosshairs as much as they have since October 7th is a national toolkit they put out shortly after October 7th, which was extremely incendiary uh, and frankly scared a lot of Jewish students on campuses because it spoke about continuing the Intifada, that, that the Intifada in the diaspora is not uh, passive, it is not defensive Palestinians, it is active. Um, this coming days after uh, the you know, horrific attacks of October 7th, um, I think understandably uh, scared many people, uh, coincided with a day of um, uh, you know, a global jihad that was called for. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to be, I, I actually think funding for student organizations and funding for professorships, in some ways, they're really separate things. Uh, funding for professorships, the key in my view is that they're be a very clear line between the funder and the institution and the way it goes about hiring and the professor and the way they go about teaching and research. Um, the fact of the matter is we now have a lot of professorships in uh, Jewish studies and Israel studies that have been funded by people with very particular ideological agendas. Uh, and I don't think that funding uh, is at all to be considered off limits, though it has been attacked by certain people, so long as it's clear that you're funding an academic position and that person will go about their research uh, and, and their teaching in a way that is appropriate uh, to their expertise and to the practices of university. And sometimes there can be a strong alignment between your outlook and the goals of their work. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're, they're independent to do their work uh, on their own. Right? There was a controversy at the University of Washington last year uh, around precisely that issue uh, with regard to Israel studies. Um, so my view is that if we are going to defend uh, the enormous role that uh, has been played by donors in really the creation of Jewish studies and Israel studies as ubiquitous fields on uh, American university campuses, then we have to accept that there will be other positions that are funded uh, by people with whom we might strongly disagree. And, and that in Middle East studies is certainly the case. I also think it's hypocritical for people in Middle East studies who you know, have positions that were uh, funded by uh, the Qatari government to uh, attack uh, someone in Jewish studies or Israel studies because they were funded by a right-wing donor who, who they don't like. Um, the, the key is, is academic freedom being maintained. I mean, th there is something that makes us squeamish about the presence of donors uh, and the way that they often seek to exert influence and the way that their you know, multi-million dollar donation may imply uh, a certain uh, level of influence. Um, but this is what we have kind of created in the American university system by the way that a lot of fields are created through donor funding. Uh, and the key becomes a willingness to draw a bright red line that says, we really appreciate your donations. We respect you as donors. You know, uh, we'll keep in touch with you about uh, this person and, and their programming. But ultimately, they have full academic freedom. There's a question from uh, from uh, Jack Schlachter um, about your, your reference to white nationalism. And... Um, I'd like to ask this also because it's it's an area that I've been working on. Um, it, it, how, when you say white nationalism, to what extent do you include white Christian nationalism? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, in some ways, the two are I think virtually synonymous today. Uh, I think when we're talking about white nationalism in this country, and anti-Semitic white nationalists, we're talking about white Christian nationalism, and I think uh, the Christian part of it runs very, very deep, right? Um, I think, uh, you know, it, that's one of the ways we can understand how Donald Trump, a candidate who, by sort of normative standards of Christian practice, would be potentially rather problematic for a lot of traditional Christians, why he did so overwhelmingly well with white evangelicals again in 2020. Uh, and I think part of it is because that identity has become racialized and become uh, connected to certain strands of white nationalism. All right, good, thank you. Um, we have many more questions and we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. And um, the, um, you know, there there is a question that has come up about, um, in a couple of different instances about the 
the people who, how do we define terminology between pa Palestinians, Arabs, uh, the people who live in that sector of the Levant? Um, and uh, of course, the, the terminology that comes into this, uh, when did when did Jewish Palestinians become Israelis? And right. how, what's the Arab terminology here? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I see at least one of those questions here uh, in the Q&A. Um, no, and, and those are good questions. I mean, some of the terminology uh, that we use today uh, is quite anachronistic if applied to older periods, right? Um, Palestinian Arabs, um, which is sort of the more, the fuller term that, that we could use to refer to, um, Arab residents of Palestine uh, in, in an older era, right? So I I, I think that that uh, actually kind of uh, so solves that problem relatively well. Uh, it is indeed odd that uh, odd odd to us, I should say, uh, that the Jews in pre-state Palestine often refer to themselves as Palestinians, right? Um, that that's a hard one for us to wrap our heads around, um, and yet I I worry I worry about all of these. Um, distinctions of language being misused for ideological purposes, right? Um, as if somehow the fact that Jews in pre-state Palestine were called Palestinians means there's no actual Palestinian indigenous movement, right? Um, which is just historically false. Um, or that Palestinian identity only began in 1948, which does not also does not appear to be a Palestinian Arab identity only began in 1948. That does not appear to be uh, factually accurate, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think we we always should dig into the histories. Um, obviously, there was also no state of Israel uh, before 1948, but the land of Israel was referred to very frequently by Jews, right? Um, so, you know, typically people will refer to um, Jews of the of the Yishuv or the new Yishuv uh, in the pre-state period. That would be Zionists uh, and Jews of the old Yishuv, who were not necessarily Zionists, who's, uh, who, who they and their um, parents and grandparents had lived in uh, Palestine for uh, decades or centuries, right, um, to, to try to draw some distinction. So there's, it, it's not, yeah, there's not a simple way to, to draw these distinctions. Um, but the point is well taken that the terminology uh, is important uh, and that we should try to ground our terms in historical contexts. Thank you to both of you for bringing this discussion and uh, bringing so much information. And, you know, I think this is uh, the largest number of Q&A comments that we've ever had in one of the talks here, which... Uh, gives you some indication of the, the level of interest and, uh, and, and the stimulation from the information that was there. So Professor Katz, Professor Gottlieb, thank you for being with us today on this Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank all of you for being here, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me to join the conversation.